All right, we're going to get started. Um, my name is Jake Sherman. I'm the director of the Brian Urquhart Center for Peace Operations here at the International Peace Institute. And it is my pleasure to welcome all of you uh, to see, it, it's really fantastic to see such a, a packed room. I'm, I'm not sure I've ever seen it quite this crowded, and it's definitely a testament to uh, what we're about to talk about and, and the importance uh, attached to it. Um, so it's, it's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the International Peace Institute and the Center for Civilians in Conflict, with whom we're very happy to partner on this topic during Protection of Civilians Week and ahead of tomorrow's open debate on protection of civilians. We're very pleased to co-host this policy forum with the permanent missions of the Kingdom of the Netherlands and of Uruguay, both of which have long records of championing protection of civilians, including during their respective tenures on the Security Council. I would like to thank Ambassador Rosselli and Ambassador Van Ostrom for their support and their participation today. It's my pleasure to welcome both of you back to IPI. Protection of civilians is now a principal task for the majority of UN peacekeeping operations, including the five largest missions in Central African Republic, Darfur, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Mali, and South Sudan. Yet it's worth remembering that this was not always the case. Today's protection mandates are a direct response to the failings of the past, most notably in Bosnia, and in Rwanda. They're a positive demonstration of UN peacekeeping's adaptation to challenges on the ground, of the moral imperative to save lives, and of the UN's critical role in both setting and upholding international norms. As we mark the 20th anniversary of the first inclusion of protection of civilians in the Security Council's agenda, and the first resolution explicitly mandating a peacekeeping operation to protect civilians in Sierra Leone, today is an important moment to reflect on the evolution of peacekeeping and approaches to protection and on how to do even better in the face of continuing and emerging threats, both on the ground in countries facing crisis and in the wider geopolitical arena. Our distinguished panel today will take stock of the progress that has been made over the past 20 years and discuss the current and future challenges in the implementation of POC mandates. I would particularly like to thank Undersecretary General Lacroix for his participation and for agreeing to share his views on the UN's efforts to protect civilians. I should also note that for IPI, this event is part of our program on protection of civilians which seeks to inform UN policy and practice to better address the most pressing challenges facing UN peace operations in the implementation of POC mandates, including strengthening accountability. We hope that today's conversation will help identify ways forward in this regard. With that, I'd like to invite Ambassador Carol Van Ostrom to make opening remarks. Ambassador, you have Some of you may have seen that when I came in, I was walking like this with a, um, a, a brace. Uh, this is about protection of civilians against dogs. I was in Holland and there was a small dog and I tripped over it and broke both my elbows. So it's, uh, I'm very happy to be back um, and it's a big honor to be here with you today. Um, if I start a round of applause, I will do like this and you will follow me because if I start clapping, it hurts. So um, I have to be very careful here. It's a big honor to be here, and I, I thank IPI, I thank Civic, and I thank Uruguay for co-organizing this with us today. Um, I'm a historian, um, and so I'll go back with you. First, I'll go back in time, 20 years, when we were in the Security Council, and we voted in favor and helped draft resolutions 1265 and 1270 on Sierra Leone, where I think it was the first time protection of civilians as a concept was included in resolutions. So we were present at the beginning, one might say. And the fact that you were there for Dutch person um, comes from a very bleak page in our history. Jake, you mentioned uh, Bosnia. Um, let's mention the word Srebrenica, where Dutch peacekeepers were on the ground with a mandate which was too ambitious and with capacities and capabilities which were insufficient to realize the mandate. We were present when there was a horrible genocide on our watch 
for over more than six, seven, eight thousand Muslim people there. And for the Kingdom of the Netherlands that has led to a historic responsibility, we feel, for improving peacekeeping operation and working with others to make sure that um, when we're in the field or when others are in the field, we are able to fulfill our mandate. Um, we were again last year in the Security Council. Let me first pay tribute to the work of uh, Uruguay and uh, certainly to Elbio Rosselli, the Perm Rep, when uh, we almost succeeded you in the Council. Uh, Italy was in between. But certainly the work you did on peacekeeping was marvelous. And this is the moment I'm going to ask you for a round of applause because this might be the last moment we have the Perm Rep of Uruguay, Elbio Rosselli, amongst us. Can I ask for a round of applause? I will do this like this for. for all the work you, you've done, uh, the enormous contribution gi you've given, certainly on protection of civilians, but also on other issues, uh, LGBTI rights with the Montevideo Declaration, other things as well. You, you leave big shoes to fill, we're gonna miss you enormously. Th thank you so much for being with us today. Um, so we've been committed to improving uh, protection of civilians all through uh, the past 20 years. It's a historic occasion to mark that today. And I've come up with 10 points, I think, uh, which might reflect that we need to do more. Uh, on paper, I think we've realized a lot, but it's about implementation on the ground and in reality that we should do better. Um, on that, we worked very closely together with uh, uh, the United Nations last year in the Action for Peacekeeping uh, Action Plan of the Secretary General, with Jean-Pierre Lacroix, um, to make sure that when peacekeepers are on the ground, they can do what they have to do. So 10 points I, I think we could discuss today. First of all, let's not forget when we talk about protection of civilians, the host nations have a huge responsibility. It's been amazing for me in the past years to see, on the one hand, in certain countries, the host nation takes its responsibility, and in others, either they don't take responsibility or have a negative attitude when it comes to UN peacekeepers. Three years ago, the active campaign of the government of South Sudan against the United Nations mission there was incredible. So we have to keep host nations to account to make sure that they fulfill their responsibility. Secondly, Security Council must ensure that peacekeeping operations have a clear mandate and has a pr proper support to carry out its protection of civilian activities. Third, within the United Peacekeeping Missions, protection of civilians should be part of the standard operating procedures, should be internalized. Fourth, member states here in New York, when we talk about uh, peacekeeping missions in the Fifth Committee, it's clear that uh, there are still limits uh, uh, imposed on peacekeeping missions which are, I would say, inappropriate. Five, in, resolution, in, in line with Resolution 2436, all parts of a peacekeeping mission at all levels should be properly trained, and I think that was also one of the key elements in the Action for Peacekeeping Plan. Um, uh, five, um, Protection of civilians needs to be an achievable re result for a mission. Uh, I had a, a good discussion with, uh, with um, uh, the Department of Peacekeeping Operations that if you say that protection of civilians is responsibility all over the country, in certain situations it's impossible. Look at Congo where we were with the Security Council last year, I think in October, beginning of November. If we were to say that it's responsibility for NUSCO to protect all citizens, all civilians in uh, Congo against all the problems they have there, it's impossible. It's, it far outruns the possibilities. At the end of the moment that um, uh, in South Sudan, UNMIS opened up its gates for thousands of South Sudanese who fled violence. It was obvious uh, Monusco, sorry, um, UNMIS had to do it. So to, f to strike the right balance between the mandate and the capabilities, I think that's a key challenge for all of us. Uh, seventh, of course, we are, is there anyone here from Rwanda? I pay tribute then in absence to the colleagues of Rwanda and the lead role they took on the Kigali principles, which translated for a large part in the Action for Peacekeeping plan last year. Uh, and I hope that even more countries will subscribe to the Kigali principles because it outlines what certainly uh, TCCs can do and PCCs in reality also in preparation. Eighth uh, point I think many of us will uh, underline today as well the importance of having women participating, both in peacekeeping operations, but also in protection of civilians. If we don't empower women, if we don't include them in decision processes on their protection, a lot of our work will be irrelevant. Ninth, so it means also that in peacekeeping operations, we should have more women. Still, the numbers are too low. And my final point at the end of uh, our Security Council membership last year 
uh, we had approval in resolution 2447 on police justice and corrections we must make sure that an integral part of what peacekeeping missions do translate in local rule of law uh, situation in prisons and so the whole chain of um, legal responsibility going on um, all of us have a role to play host countries tccs pccs donors Secu security council united nations civil society i'm happy to see so many ngos here today uh, and maybe i might close off with a question to jean-pierre lacroix um, uh, what do you see as the major challenges and achievements maybe i should start with the major achievements in the past 20 years and remaining challenges and what do you think are the things all of us could do to address those challenges and can i ask a warm round of applause for jean Vercois, please and that's a very good segue to our next speaker it's my pleasure to invite under secretary general jean-pierre lacroix to the podium please Good afternoon. Thank you very much for being here. And a special thank to uh, both uh, Karen and Elbio and uh, their country, their permanent mission, and uh, also uh, greetings to uh, friends uh, on the panel. Um, I um, thank you for organizing the uh, event on the protection of civilian. Uh, it's really timely. It's uh, 20 years since we uh, had the first Monday on protection of civilian. And since then, uh, protection of civilian has become uh, one of the key elements of our mandates in uh, at least the biggest peacekeeping operations. But I would argue that all peacekeeping operations, whatever the mandate, ultimately are about protection of civilian. I think uh, I'll try to make five points, um, which are the following. First, uh, I believe that uh, peace, uh, protection of civilian is uh, one of the greatest achievements of peacekeeping. I think it needs to be underlined because we rightly put the emphasis on uh, the shortcomings, the challenges, the failures. I think it's uh, uh, right to do that. But at the same time, let us not forget that uh, uh, the countries that uh, return to stability because or with the help of peacekeeping, uh, basically were in a better position to uh, ensure protection of civilians as a result of that improvement in their security situation. Um, the uh, current situations where uh, in countries like uh, South Sudan or Central African Republic or DRC, uh, we do protect um, hundreds of thousands of civilians every single day, uh, be it uh, IDPs in our POC camps in South Sudan or uh, in our uh, IDP uh, facilities in uh, Central African Republic or uh, communities that are protected and that uh, are getting better access to humanitarian support, uh, either in Mali or DRC or Central African Republic or South Sudan, again, Darfur. In, in all these cases, uh, we um, make, I think, uh, the difference between uh, life and death for many of those civilians. Certainly, we uh, make a real difference in terms of their protection. Now. My second point would be um, protection of civilians is probably, in addition to being one of the greatest achievements of peacekeeping, it's probably our greatest challenge as well. Because um, it's, by definition, always below expectations. Um, and it's only natural. Uh, no matter how many peacekeepers we have, civilian, police, military, we are never able to put peacekeepers in every village, in every location, in every place where there are civilians under threat. And, uh, and, but by being there, by being deployed, we, raise we create and raise expectations to a level that is very difficult to meet uh, in practice. And uh, that is really a problem that we have to address. The other challenge is that we um, are now operating in environments that are much more dangerous and challenging than they were before. Um, protection of civilians is not new in peacekeeping. Uh, the dangers of being a peacekeeper is not new per se, but uh, the fact of uh, being targeted uh, as peacekeeper, not only not in spite of being under the blue helmet, but because of that, the same for our humanitarian colleagues who are also paying high price, 
uh, for their efforts to protect civilians. That is new, and it's a threat that is very real in Mali and uh, um, in the DRC, Central African Republic, uh, to a certain extent, South Sudan. But in addition to that, um, it's a challenge that is compounded by the fact that in some of the places where we operate, uh, we don't get the kind of uh, support that we would need from the host country. Now, in some places, it's very simple. It's just because the state is non-existent. Uh, so it's really up for us to uh, make up for that. But in other places, it is because we don't have the kind of support that we need from uh, the host government or because the political dynamics and situations are so complicated that they result in um, more challenges uh, to us. Now, the third point that I would like to make is um, protection of civilian is multidimensional. Um, and I think it's important to underline that uh, I believe sometimes or too often the uh, perception of protection of civilian, um, including by, I think, uh, with all due respect, some of our member states, is civilians are under threat and we need to send uh, a company of peacekeeper to deal with that. But it's much more complicated than that. And I think uh, we've been um, coming to realize uh, that it needs a multi dimensional response. But that would be my fourth point. In order to be effective in uh, bringing that multi-dimensional uh, response to the challenge that protection of civilian is for us, we have to have the right kind of capabilities. And I would add the right kind of organization because it's partly about capabilities. It's partly about planning. It's also about how do we organize internally and that would also include how do we cooperate with other partners, which then leads me to my last point, which is that protection of civilian has to be a partnership. There's only so much that peacekeeping can do. It can do a lot, actually, depending on where we are, probably less so in DRC in relation to the size of the country and the size of MONUSCO, which is no larger in its number than a New York police department in a country of 100 million inhabitants. But um, it has to be a partnership uh, with uh, the agency funds and programs, NGOs, the host government, uh, um, obviously the communities that we're serving, and so on and so forth. So these would be my five points very quickly. Now, I don't want to sort of um, dwell too much on the achievements, but I think they need to be highlighted. I think we need to be uh, rightly uh, you know, proud and, and vocal about what peacekeeping and our colleagues on the ground are achieving every single day in protecting these hundreds of thousands of civilians. And, uh, uh, and uh, you know, some of our colleagues are, you know, from the field are here, and I would like to pay tribute to them and through them to all our colleagues that are doing this great job every single day. Now, challenges. Well, uh, we, uh, first of all, uh, you know, the ideal protection of civilians is where we have a durable political settlement. You know, ultimately, peacekeeping is about creating space to achieve political solution. And therefore, uh, we need to uh, keep focusing on how to make better progress in achieving lasting political solutions. It's challenging. I think it's especially challenging because we operate in environments that are also complex from the point of view of the political dynamics, but also we have a divided Security Council. And a divided Security Council means that we have less, we have enough support to have our mandate extended on a regular basis, but we don't have enough support to provide the kind of influence and pressure that would be needed on the parties to make progress in the direction of achieving durable settlement. So that's, uh, I think, uh, a key element, which uh, is part of the reason why action for peacekeeping places the primacy of politics very in the very first position of the priorities. This is where we need uh, 
strong support from uh, any influential partner, certainly our member states. Now, uh, and unfortunately, these peace processes are uh, too slow to materialize, uh, and uh, as a result of that, we're left, you know, with staying in uh, different places where we deploy with no uh, prospect of exit in sight. Um, I talked about the uh, uh, the threats, the increased threats against us and uh, the the civilians. I think uh, uh, you uh, are aware of a couple of examples, uh, like in a DRC. Uh, David, you're quite familiar with the eastern part of DRC, where civilians are faced with the likes of uh, ADF, uh, the X number of my my groups. In Mali, violent extremism, the uh, terrorist groups, the groups that are either criminal or terrorist or a combination thereof, criminal in the day, terrorist in the night, uh, and what it means to us uh, in our mission to protect civilians. And it has a lot of implication, including the implication that uh, in some cases where civilians are not only under threat but also intimidated, then their ability and readiness to work with us is limited by that. This is something that we also have to understand. In some cases, like South Sudan, we are dedicating a lot of resources to protecting uh, civilians in camps, what we call POC camps. And that's because uh, many of these civilians are seen as, uh, at least by the current government, as opponents. And uh, the sense is that uh, if they were to be uh, left out of these camps, their lives would be under threat. I hope that the revitalized peace agreement in South Sudan, which has already brought much less violence and the greater access of uh, humanitarian support, uh, will eventually enable us to, uh, 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 to create a condition whereby these civilians will go back to their home and maybe with a different kind of uh, support from us and the international community. But definitely this uh, increased violence is a major uh, challenge and it's compounded by the fact that uh, uh, we don't have the or at least we don't always have the kind of resources that would be needed to face uh, these uh, challenges um, i spoke about uh, how we create expectations and how uh, these expectations cannot be met all the time uh, unfortunately recently we had uh, 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 a tragic incident where in the Central African Republic in the uh, northwestern part of uh, that country in uh, Pawa, uh, I think more than 30 civilians were killed uh, as a result of apparently a retaliation by uh, a group called the 3R uh, against those, you know, following a, uh, uh, another killing episode. Now, uh, we, we had other such instances and, and uh, now, how can we draw the consequences of that? How can we uh, learn the lesson? Uh, but we, we're doing, um, you know, uh, a number of things to to draw the lesson. But as uh, at the same time, uh, the uh, uh, the fact that uh, we won't, we don't, and we won't have uh, resources necessary to cover. Uh, you know, more broadly, uh, the territory in which we operate is uh, is a challenge. But I think uh, this would uh, require from us uh, increased effort to adjust our footprint, our methodologies, uh, the way in which we uh, carry out protection of civilians, because we know that uh, these additional resources will not be forthcoming. So we have to do our best with uh, what we have. Um, the last thing is uh, about the challenges that uh, we, um, we need uh, to have uh, protection of civilian uh, identified as a clear priority. And that takes us to the notion of clear prioritized mandates. Um, I think uh, pro protection of civilian is uh, together with support to political solution and capacity building uh, one of the three key priorities of uh, of peacekeeping at least in this multi-dimensional uh, operations and uh, and the more we we have clarity on this i think uh, the better i think there are a number of other tasks that can be 
uh, relevant in some cases uh, of peacekeeping, but I think uh, that we need to really keep the focus around these three priorities, and I think that provides uh, a, a good framework for, uh, for, for, uh, for our task. Now, peacekeeping is multidimensional. I think uh, where we've made some progress in uh, uh, sort of refining the way in which we carry out uh, protection of civilians is uh, in uh, delivering policies and guidance that reflect this uh, multidimensional character of uh, protection of civilians. Um, you know, a few examples uh, from uh, recent past, uh, we, uh, and actually current practice of, uh, of our peacekeeping operations, um, we, uh, we're facing a deteriorating situation in the center of Mali, and uh, the factors that have brought these uh, deterioration are multiple. It comes from uh, the role of terrorist group, the uh, traditionals of uh, uh, tensions between different groups of herders, farmers, compounded by ethnic rivalries, uh, with an addition of uh, uh, re religious uh, components that are being also uh, fueled by uh, the presence of uh, radical groups, uh, climate change, uh, the, the 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 impact of a of a very uh, strong demography and so on and so forth and uh, we um, you know the the way in which we try to address this and to support the Malian government in in addressing uh, protection of civilian in the center of Mali is uh, as integrated as we can in other words uh, when uh, the one of the key role uh, uh, of our mission in protection of civilian is to try to diffuse local tensions. And uh, I want to emphasize that because this is something that is often under the radar screen, but we have many colleagues who are very effective in uh, what I call local conflict resolution in diffusing local tensions and in working to bring communities together. This is what we're doing in uh, the center of uh, Mali. I think uh, this is also what MONUSCO is doing in many places. Actually, I think DRC is an example where uh, many local conflicts occur uh, in most parts of that country and that our colleagues, uh, civilian uh, with an expertise in uh, uh, diffusing tension, bringing communities together, uh, work hard together with uh, the military and, and the police. Uh, um, the, um, uh, and, and therefore, integrating these components, making sure that we work together uh, in a way that is as effective uh, as, uh, as, as possible is uh, uh, really important. I would also add that um, what uh, a key element of uh, 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 protection of civilians is, is prevention. Uh, as I say, I mean, prevent, uh, protection of civilians is not only about identifying threat and identifying the, the way to respond to it, including with uh, 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 military uh, uh, or uniform uh, force. It's really about uh, prevention. And here uh, we have uh, a number of tools that we've developed uh, to uh, to sort of uh, make sure that uh, we acquire better situational awareness, we uh, engage uh, better with the local communities uh, in such a way as to have better information as, and, and therefore be better able to deter, prevent, preempt threats, um, and uh, making sure that uh, we can if needed, uh, we, we can react before these threats come on us and on the civilian population. That takes a lot of uh, uh, engagement, uh, and I think uh, this is where uh, the role of uh, our uh, community liaison assistant, particularly in the uh, DRC, but also MINUSCA and UNMIS, is very important. This is how uh, the community, uh, so-called community alert networks uh, can be very effective. Uh, this is also where uh, we certainly need to improve our ability to uh, gather information and to make sure that whatever information we gather can actually be actionable, uh, that we, uh, we act on these and we put ourselves in a position to act on these uh, information. Uh, that takes me to the uh, uh, capabilities that we need and how can we improve uh, our efficiency in, uh, in protecting civilians. And, and here, 
I would begin by what I was saying about uh, uh, prevention. Um, it's a question of uh, better engaging. I think the role of women in peacekeeping uh, is particularly important in that domain. Not that you know I would limit the role of women in peacekeeping in, in to that. I, I think uh, that we need to uh, create a better space and greater space for women in all areas of peacekeeping. Frankly, there are no area where uh, women should not uh, play their part as well as men, but I, it's proven and it's definitely uh, a fact that uh, when we use uh, more women in uh, community engagement, when like in South Lebanon we use female engagement team, we create the kind of trust and confidence that then enables us to be more effective in uh, protecting civilians. Um, uh, creating trust, creating uh, this condition whereby we're getting more information, therefore uh, we uh, do better prevention. Um, but another thing is about how do we um, acquire not only better situation awareness, which also has to do with expertise and the use of some new technologies, but it's about how do we organize ourselves so that whatever we get as an information, we can then act on it or uh, there has to, or, or how, how we can organize follow-up on any information we have. And I think this also has to do with uh, the way we're organized. We systematically investigate every major incident where we think we failed in protecting civilians. We've done that in uh, the RC, we've done that in Central African Republic in many cases. And what we see as a result of these investigations is that systematically the cause of the failure are multiple. It's not only about a TCC or a unit, or it's about us, it's about how uh, we were present in a given uh, context, how uh, the civilian and the police and the military were interacting together, um, and how therefore uh, able we were to detect what would then happen. And, and I think this issue of organization will acquire an even greater importance as we move towards further progress in implementing action for peacekeeping. Capacities, quick reaction, intelligence, air mobility, all this is very important. We do put a lot of, a lot of emphasis on improving uh, the impact of our um, uniform units, the military, the police. Uh, we keep asking these kind of assets for our member states. We keep insisting on training and particularly training regarding uh, the specificities of uh, protection of civilian because if you deploy as a peacekeeper, or police or military, then you have to be aware of what protection of civilian means and how you have to respond to that as a peacekeeper. But in addition to that, I strongly believe that we also have to make a lot of effort regarding the the way we are organized uh, at the national, local level, how we work as a team, how we make sure that in a given context where we feel that there are potential threats to civilian, uh, the military talks to the civilian, we don't have a two-star general talking to a P3 uh, uh, or with, with uh, I mean, this sort of inadequate kind of uh, uh, level and, and organization and staffing that uh, you know, make things uh, really difficult to achieve. Now, uh, capabilities uh, that will uh, then take me to uh, the uh, 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 you know the next uh, item that I wanted to highlight. Uh, I just want to make sure that I follow more or less my uh, yeah, which is a partnership. Now, um, first of all, to improve all these uh, areas of uh, capabilities that I mentioned, and certainly we need to work ourselves on in organization training all of this uh, reaching out to uh, uh, for better capacity equipment and so on and so forth. At the same time, uh, we need a stronger partnership. First of all, stronger support from the Security Council. Protection of civilian is uh, uh, part of most of our mandates. Uh, it's, um, it's not fully uh, consensual as a notion. And, and we see here and there, uh, and those uh, 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 representative who are currently in the Security Council or who were recently in the Security Council know what I'm talking about. There are some divisions when it comes to the, the conceptual approach of, of protection of civilians. I think uh, that is a bit of, a, of an issue to us and, and uh, 
I would say, especially when it comes to how to factor in uh, human rights uh, in uh, the mix of protection of civilians. I do believe that uh, human rights are a key component of uh, our protection of, effort, uh, of civilian effort. We also need partnership because we, uh, as I said, all the capacities that we need uh, the, the, the technical capacity, the efforts on training, all of this, the, the new skills, the new assets, uh, we can provide some guidance, we can provide some support, and, uh, but, but essentially most of our means are provided by member states, therefore we need their support for that. But in addition to that, partnership is also about siding with the uh, uh, regional, sub-regional organization uh, in our political efforts, in our uh, practical efforts on the ground to work on specific situations. It's definitely about promoting a better, more integrated UN presence on the ground. I think it's very important, and I think our achievements there are uneven. I'm not saying this uh, by way of being diplomatic. I think in some mission it works better than other, but it's key because we cannot be successful in protecting civilians if you don't work together with the humanitarian uh, partners with NGOs, of course, the UN agencies uh, specialized in the, in the humanitarian delivery as well as the uh, development uh, partner. So all of this really is uh, uh, about partnership. And, and I think that uh, <clears throat> moving forward, and particularly in the context of Action for Peacekeeping, where uh, we put a great deal of emphasis on both protection of civilian as well as partnership, uh, we need to emphasize that. We need to uh, make sure that uh, there's a clear understanding that uh, we cannot, uh, you know, we'll continue to do our best and to try to improve our ability to deliver better on protection of the civilian, but at the same time, it has to be a, a collective endeavor. And last but not least, a partnership from the host government. Then again, Protecting civilians is primarily a responsibility of the host government. It has to be repeated time and again, and we need that understanding to be clear, but we also need the support of our member states, the Security Council, in making that clear, and in cases where we don't have that uh, willingness I'm not talking about capacity. Central African Republic is, is a case where in most parts of the countries we don't have a state. And the only thing that we can do is to try to bring the state back to where it's not present at the moment. But where we have a, a functioning state which is not working as sort of uh, in, in as forthcoming a way as needed in helping us in our protection of civilian mandate, then we certainly need to have stronger support from our member states, particularly from the Security Council. So uh, this would be my last uh, word. I hope I haven't forgotten uh, any uh, major thing. Uh, but uh, thank you again for having me and, uh, and congratulations for organizing this event. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lacroix, for this exhaustive overview of um, the progress made by the Secretariat to protect civilians, the reforms needed to uh, address the remaining challenges. I think it's a great introduction for the panel discussion. Um, so good afternoon. My name is Nami Diradza. I am a senior fellow at uh, IPI. Uh, IPI is Brian Urquhart Center for Peace Operations. And I am the head of IPI's Protection of Civilians program. I will be moderating this discussion. We have an exceptional panel today. Um, of course, we will build on what has been said on the fact that 20 years ago, uh, the Security Council established the first explicit mandate uh, for peace operations to protect civilians, and that in itself marked a crucial transformation of the UN and of peacekeeping. Um, after the failures of Rwanda and Bosnia, as it was mentioned, now we have a normative framework to ensure peacekeepers' duty to protect civilians. And since 1999, 14 missions have been mandated to protect civilians. Eight, act, eight active missions are still mandated to do so. The Secretariat has developed a lot of policies, guidance, training on protection of civilians. Missions have developed protection of civilians tools, coordination mechanisms, mission-wide uh, POC strategies. They hired staff and advisors dedicated to protection of civilians. And they have also strengthened uh, the integrated approach of protection of civilians. As uh, Mr. Lacroix mentioned, the multidimensional approach is key as 
uh, military um, intervention is not sufficient to ensure protection of civilians. So missions had to adapt and expand the toolkit uh, of military postures, police initiatives, and civilian activities that all contribute to protecting civilians, from deterrent presence to offensive operations, from DDR to human rights monitoring, political engagement, local mediation, early warning or community policing. So I'm sure our panelists will probably give us many examples uh, demonstrating the profound integration, professionalization, and rationalization of POC. Um, that said, uh, we know that peace operations have striven to do more to protect, but they are also facing many challenges, uh, as it was mentioned earlier. Peacekeepers operate in increasingly hostile and non-permissive environments. They are asked to do more with less in a context of political and financial pressure. And a number of reviews have highlighted persistent shortcomings and a general lack of accountability for POC. So today we are taking stock of 20 years of POC and I will ask our panelists to provide their vision of the progress made, the remaining challenges, and the needed reforms to ensure that the protection of civilians of local population that rely on peacekeepers will be ensured. Um, so I will introduce our panelists. Uh, Ms. Bintu Keita is the Assistant Secretary General for Africa of the UN Departments of Peace Operations and Political and Peacebuilding Affairs. She also served as Deputy Joint Special Representative for the AU-UN Hybrid Operation in Darfur, UNAMID, and uh, was the Chief of Staff and Director of Operations for the UN Mission for e Ebola Emergency Response. Mr. Gressley is the Deputy Special Representative for Operations and the Rule of Law for MONUSCO, the UN mission in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Mr. Gressley also served as Deputy Special Representative of the Secretary General in Mali, as well as Regional Coordinator in the UN mission in Sudan. Lieutenant Commander Marcia Braga is the former Military Protection of Civilians and Gender Advisor of MINUSCA, the UN mission in the Central African Republic. In 2019, she received the Military Gender Advocate of the Year Award. Ms. Alison Giffen is the Director of Civic's Peacekeeping Program. Prior to joining Civic, she served as the Senior Advisor for UN Peacekeeping with the US State Department. So it is with great pleasure that I first give the floor to Ms. Bintu Keita to open the discussion. Ms. Keita, you had first-hand experience of POC challenges in Darfur, and as the ASG for Africa, you are closely following, following the performance of the biggest missions mandated to protect civilians. So we would welcome your thoughts on uh, these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, first of all, let me also uh, join my voice to uh, thank IPI and CIVIC and uh, the Permanent Mission of Netherlands and Uruguay for organizing uh, this event. And I can see the uh, room is full, so there is a lot of interest, which is good, uh, because we need uh, engagement and continuous attention uh, to the work that we are doing, uh, particularly when we hear more about uh, uh, the debates on what we are not doing versus what we are doing every day. Uh, and with more than 100,000 uh, peacekeepers, both men, women, civilian, uniformed people. So with all of this, uh, it's an everyday job. And it's an everyday job in uh, very difficult circumstances in most of the places where we are working. So I, I, I really pleading with all of you uh, when you start throwing stones at the peacekeepers that you remember in which type of environment they are living in and they are working under very difficult circumstances. So uh, let me give you, because I think uh, uh, Under Secretary General uh, Lacroix has covered all of what we are doing actually in terms of the efforts of the Secretariat. But to uh, jumpstart this conversation, I want to give you some of the examples on how it is multidimensional to approach the protection of civilians. So I'm going to delve into my time in Darfur as the person responsible for protection and protection in, in the larger sense of protection. So we have the three tiers that everybody knows. But just let me give you one example. In January 2016, more than 21,000 people left Jebel Mara and arrived at a place where there was nothing literally except our 275 peacekeepers from the Ethiopian contingent 
who suddenly were overwhelmed with the uh, IDPs arriving. So of course, when we were called, what happened is how quick we could go there and reinforce the, uh, uh, um, the strengths of our peacekeepers uh, who were there with only 275 people. So just have this in, in image. And you had mostly women and children and women who had uh, uh, given birth uh, through the road that they were following to arrive at uh, this uh, place called Sortoni. So when I decided to go there, uh, what happened is we, and this is the host government consent, we had a land, uh, helipad. We were not authorized as UNAMID to go and land there. So what we did, went to Cap Cabilla and decided with the support and escort from uh, colleagues, peacekeepers from Cap Cabilla, to go by road. You feature that. By road, almost six hours in uh, APC with at the same time having the uh, humanitarian colleagues coming with us in an escort in order to arrive at that place and start engaging with the community. And you know what happened? In that day when we arrived, we just realized, and this comes to the place of how important it is for women to be there. Most of our peacekeepers were men. So they could not engage and they could not go and see within the, 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 the site what was happening with the women because they are shy, they have to, uh, to protect their privacy. So when I was going in, I would be going in and saying to my male colleagues, please, you have to stay aside. You cannot come in because there we had naked children, almost naked women having to, 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 to just deal with what they had. So this is the, one of the aspects of the importance of having women. Going back, now engaging multidimensional, so you see having, uh, uh, going there, being present physically for the peacekeepers, but also for the internally displaced people, was to go to Khartoum, engage in Khartoum, engage with the Wali, and have conversation with the Wali in order for them to be responsive and to deploy police and the security forces who can protect our uh, uh, internally displaced people and making sure that the road would be available for the delivery of the uh, humanitarian support. But then also engaging with people who were cutting the road, and this is one of the, the other, uh, other thing in terms of multidimensional, engaging with the armed group who were cutting the road because at some point in the process of uh, giving support, we had to arrest two people who had killed some of the uh, internally displaced people. So for almost one year, we had to negotiate in order to have the road open for the delivery of the uh, uh, humanitarian relief. But on top of it, if you start seeing peacekeepers and they are present with their, uh, with their uh, uh, guns or weapons, we also had to create the space for the observation in order to protect the area, which meant what? Constructing with our engineer, our peacekeepers, but also our civilian engineers to construct observation towers all over the place. Just imagine, I think we had to construct more than six observation towers in order to be able to, through day and night, watch for the uh, people who will be coming and threatening to the, to the IDPs. This is another, another aspect of the protection. The other aspect of the protection would be to have the humanitarian colleagues and all the components of the mission in one meeting, talking about how we would go about the prioritization of what needs to happen in terms of escort, in terms of patrolling, because people would have to go out, and particularly the women, for firewood collection or water collection. So there, if there is one thing I want to say is, I do understand humanitarian space. I've been humanitarian myself. But the thing is now, I think we are becoming too much dogmatic about these things to a point where it is not helping the people that we are there to serve. 
So this is, this is one, one, one aspect of it. And then 1.6 million of internally, di internally displaced people. And we have, at that time, I think we had 12,000 peacekeepers. So can we be around each one of, of, of the uh, uh, people, internally displaced people? Was not possible. So what we did, we had identified the hot spots where we would have to increase the way we will be doing the patrolling of the environment in order to create a safe space and secure environment for people to move in and out. And then they people, the people also have their livelihoods, so the fa farming. So what we did, we also added, and again multidimensional, taking care of protecting the crops with support also from the state authorities involving the police, uh, particularly in order to do that. Now coming to uh, one of the features that you mentioned, uh, Jean-Pierre, which is about the uh, community liaison uh, and uh, particularly in the engagement with the community for the early warning and the early response. One example of what the fourth police unit was able to do. And again, I'm going back to the Sortoni. I was going to Sortoni almost every month. And in the third month, we had uh, deployed uh, on, on month two, a fourth police unit from Jordan. And we also had uh, from Malawi. One of my surprise, and I think this is important, was one of the women who was from, the, uh, from Malawi she learned the language. She learned the language, and the, when I was going with her visiting the internally displaced people, she was engaging in the language the people understood. So from that, the quality of the information of what was happening to them uh, was uh, very much valued because then on the basis of the information, we were able to increase the response that we are providing for the entire 21,000 people over time. And I'm being told you are speaking too much. Uh, just stop. I wanted to be, uh, this to be a vivid discussion based on memory. And of course, you all know that uh, Darfur is undergoing a transition and a drawdown within a country which is also going under transition. And I stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ms. Keita, for these um, fascinating lessons from uh, Darfur that also show the multidimensional aspects of, of the protection crisis. And um, from that, I will actually move to Mr. Gressley. Um, you have served uh, in various leadership roles, but uh, including in MONUSCO currently, which is actually a mission often described as a laboratory for protection of Syrians. So we would love to have concrete examples from this mission too. Thanks. Some laboratory experiments, okay. Uh, what, uh, you know, I'm gonna start off on a totally different uh, tack on this. Um, I, I just came off of break. I, was, I took a two week break and that gave me a little bit of time to do other things. Um, and I was reading up on the rollout of the 5G network system globally and so forth, which prompted me at one point to think, well, what was 1G? Uh, so I looked it up 1G and um, it was quite interesting. 1G was uh, actually the analog phones that we all first had back and those were introduced 1979 in Japan, in fact. And I also discovered that there was such a thing called a zero G, which is everything before cell phones. And then, of course, there's two G. I, I followed the whole thing. Two G is uh, when we had SMS messaging and went digital. Three G allowed smartphones to, to come in, and a lot of other things started to come in. Uh, 3.5, 3.75, LTE, etc. And then four G, of course, allows the, the video streaming, uh, ve uh, video teleconferencing. And now the debate is what is. Uh, 5G going to look like, um, and, and the standards and so forth and the expectations. And it was interesting reading all that. And what I got out of that, well, number one is that each generation, as I mentioned starting in 79, took about 10 years. Um, each had a set of expectations. We've all had our frustrations with cell phones and not always meeting our expectations. 
Um, but as you use a technology, you realize there's greater potential, and each generation provided that. More reliability, uh, faster, and more capabilities. And it, it made me reflect a little bit about the history of uh, protection of civilians. And if you look at the protection of civilians, I thought about it. I uh, went back, um, we'll start with the Congo. Uh, in fact, uh, the first mission in the Congo in 1960 didn't have a mandate from the council, but it did have an operational directive, uh, number eight actually, which said to protect unarmed groups. I never heard that term before, unarmed groups. I thought those were civilians, but anyway, uh, I interpreted it that way. Uh, through interposition and the use of force if necessary. So I thought, well, that's kind of like the zero G pre-analog cell phone, so maybe we could go with that. And I carried that analogy forward, as you can imagine. Um, uh, you know, I looked at 1G, well, maybe that was the UN Protection Force uh, in ex-Yugoslavia in 1992, uh, which had an indirect POC I, I, focusing on the humanitarian space and uh, uh, access and protection of safe areas. Um, and we know some of the history behind that. Uh, then we went to more mandated POC, uh, specific by the, uh, by the council in 1999 with Sierra Leone. And then, I call that 2G, uh, and then we moved to a prioritized POC, uh, I could call that 3G. And as I said, there are multiple inter, you know, advancements inside 3G on the telecom side. But I think the same was true, actually if you take, uh, you, were, you were mentioning Congo, um, uh, a lot of that was done in the Congo in terms of joint protection teams. It's where civilian alert networks were first established. The fight against impunity for those who commit uh, uh, gross uh, human rights violations, particularly oriented to sexual uh, assault and so forth. Uh, a lot of that came in at that time frame, uh, and I have to give credit to our current SRSG who was in my position at that time for having worked on a number of those issues. Uh, in 2000, that was in around 2007. 2013, we had the FIB authorized for offensive operation. Call that 4G. So what does 5G POC look like then, if that's where we're headed? Um, and, and, and I thought about that. Um, well, first thing I noted, as I mentioned on the, on the telecom side, it was every 10 years. Here, these generational changes are having on POC every five years or so, twice as fast. Um, the expectations are such that it's driving that. Um, and, and many of these points were made. Uh, you know, the, the, key, the key thing with the telecoms is they have very specific standards for each of those to qualify for each of those standards. The ambiguities of our mandate sometimes is, it can be a, uh, an issue. Uh, inconsistency of leadership, understanding uh, how to deal with that uh, POC mandate. Expectations by member states, by the public, uh, can be varied uh, from the mandate, from capabilities, uh, matching capabilities to expectations. But I also like to highlight that even the word protection of civilians can have different meanings depending on the context. There's humanitarian protection of civilians, which doesn't exactly overlap with uh, the security POC, and neither does international human rights law necessarily fully overlap, but we use the same word, so that can also create false expectations. Anyway, so I thought about, you know, well, this is what we're working on is 5G POC, if I could, I won't use that anymore after this, but uh, I think I'd be tortured that analogy enough, but, um, I think uh, what we're trying to, to implement, uh, uh, the experiments we're trying to implement now to complement what was done back in 2007, 8, 9, 10, um, uh, and even in the first mission, uh, is, is looking at, I would say, the following capabilities. Number one, rapid mobility, particularly by our military, uh, extremely important. New capabilities by our military as well. So that would be one, one category. Two, comprehensive integrated, uh, joint strategies across the mission for specific issues, uh, joint operations, and I'm talking internal uh, uh, in terms of uh, how, we, how we do our work internally. Our engagement with partners that has been mentioned multiple times as, as a part of that comprehensive approach. Decentralized would be the third. If you're dealing in a country with multiple, uh, in our case, over 100 armed groups, you can't have one strategy. You have to have targeted strategies that are specific to a, to a specific context. 
Uh, and that requires a decentralized management, a decentralized leadership, and an empowered leadership on the ground that can take uh, active decisions. And, and the final piece I would put into to, to that kind of structure uh, of, of uh, specifications would be targeted. Uh, the strategies have to be targeted. The joint operations have to be targeted. Now, I won't take too much more time uh, because I, I know you want to open this to, to discussion, but I would like to highlight how we actually approach it in general, including with these elements. Um, I think number one is threat identification and, and trying to do that in as quickly as possible so that our, we don't want to go in and count bodies. We want to stop it before that happens. So our, our civilian alert network has been our primary measure for doing that over the years. It's now expanded so that we have, I think, 900 plus communities uh, in that network, 65 uh, different networks, in fact. We continue to expand it using telecoms, uh, so I can go back to that for a moment. Uh, we have worked with telecom companies to expand their cell phone coverage so that we can actually uh, get communities hooked up so that they can make an alert. But what's, what's interesting is we get about 50, uh, 500 or so uh, alerts per month. Uh, so that's quite a few. Uh, most of them, actually, we don't have to respond to. We have about an 85% response rate to all of those alerts. But it's combined between national forces, security forces, and ourselves. And the core point of protection of civilians being a, a responsibility of the national government is central, and it's central to the alert network system. They carry out the book. Uh, we do it where we are present. They do it where they're present. But they're more numerous, so that's in a better position. Number two is the reinforced intelligence architecture, which is uh, being rolled out globally uh, in peacekeeping, is extremely important. And we're, we're, we're investing a great deal deal in that, including at the local level, uh, which is where we see the greatest benefit coming from that. We also do quarterly forward-looking reviews um, to, to identify um, threats that have not fully materialized but, but are, are escalating and require a substantive uh, uh, response. Now, in that overall context, I, I think you can divide our, our response into three broad areas. One is the immediate response. Uh, the, uh, the, the military showing up or, or, or the, the, the basic you know, quick response type of uh, thing before an acute uh, type of um, attack that's happening. That's what our alert network does. Um, and, and we have been doing that for, for a long time. Uh, so that's one, is the immediate. Medium term would be basically identifying uh, threats that are escalating and de-escalate. And this is where our protection through presence and our protection through projection come in. And, and just to, to speak to those two very quickly, protection through presence, uh, I don't think it's under, often understood just how important showing up and being there is. Nobody wants to commit war crimes in front of uh, international witnesses. It has an immediately, immediate freezing of the situation. Extremely important to be there. So we have divided up our presence in two forms. One is permanent presence, where we have an intersection of a number of elements that are just persistently providing protection threats, and we need to be there permanently. And then the other areas where uh, a periodic presence is required, and that's through projection. But projection is not projection of a military force. It's projection on a comprehensive approach, and it requires um, uh, uh, pre-planning and thinking of objectives that you want to achieve, the political objectives, security objectives, humanitarian support, situational awareness. And so we ask our head of offices to lead this uh, part and, and to, to uh, deploy as quickly as possible, but do it in a strategic way and to surge back if necessary and build up a response to de-escalate. And we've done that many times. I would like to cite one example of that. Uh, I'm glad our, our, the permanent representative of Uruguay is here because I want to praise his contingent there, uh, who've been a long-term supporter of, of MINUSCO. Uh, when we had significant problems in Jugu territory at the beginning of last year, we needed to really uh, implement this protection through projection uh, for, for the first time. Uh, and, and to their credit, the Uruguayans deployed from Kisangani in the center of the country to the uh, eastern border in 48 hours they were deployed. That's exactly what we want to see. 
uh, rapid presence. Their presence served as a base for uh, securing population, a base for our civilians to go out uh, and work on de-escalating uh, tensions. We worked with the government uh, to get them out there as well. And it, it actually de-escalated that situation quite quickly. The final one, and I will finish, um, is the, is the long term, which is, I've talked about immediate response, I've talked about de-escalation, we need to end conflict. That's the ultimate protection. <clears throat> and this is where our comprehensive approach in terms of targeted strategies, which is looking at how to end a, a, a particular conflict. One example, because I have no time uh, really, is currently we're working in Ituri province. Uh, we've started this process over 12 months ago to engage with the FRPI, a major group that's been operating there for uh, 20 some years. Um, uh, without going through the process, here we took a more political as opposed to military, but the military played a role of containment and also mediation support. Uh, and we've been able to work that process through local communities, local provincial authorities, ultimately going to the national government and, 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 and seeing all of this come together to a, uh, to, we're, we're on the verge, I think, of an actual agreement there to end that particular conflict. Uh, the new government has now taken it up. Um, and what we have seen in, as a result of this is an immediate drop uh, of human rights violations by at least 90%. Um, it, it, is, it, it shows you that this can be done. It's not done yet, but it can be done. And, and an integrated strategy to end conflict has to be integrated in all of this. Let me just finish before I'm told to finish. Um, in terms of the challenges, I would, I would say, uh, I think the management reform that's underway is extremely important to support the decentralization that I, I referred to. Maintaining consent of government is central. Uh, there are behavior things that we could probably modify not to exacerbate problems, but there are also certain areas where, uh, I would say there's some red lines where uh, we really need to make sure that we can continue to be operational. Um, I would say issues of, uh, maybe I'll just finish with this, I, but I think our biggest issue is that the silos continue. And, and, and I use the analogy, it's like, if the silos are like that and you just try to make everything horizontal and work, but you take the pressure off, the silos come back. And that's the, that's the danger. And the management reform is gonna to have to deal with that to allow that horizontal management. I'm not talking in Kinshasa at this point. I'm talking in the decentralized field. If you're going to have a decentralized approach, you need to have a management structure that's conducive to that. Omoja is not conducive to that um, uh, at this point in time. We don't even have on our human resources uh, specific uh, uh, categories for our heads of offices, deputy head of offices, and so forth. So our tendency is to go to political officers who may not have they're good political officers, but they're not necessarily leaders who can pull all these components together. So we need to design a system that allows the right kind of leadership and that recognizes the, a decentralized process. Let me stop there. I have several other challenges, <laughs> but I am your challenge right now, so I'll be Thank you so much, Mr. <laughs> Thank you. I will immediately give the floor to Lieutenant Commander Braga, uh, who will provide um, some insights from the Central African Republic. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for this opportunity to talk uh, about my job in MINUSC as Force Headquarters Military Gender Advisor. In fact, I developed this job for one year. Well, first, I will explain a little bit about the activities of a military gender advisor. In fact, a military gender advisor acts as the, for the primary expert for all gender and child protection related matters. So, and for force commander, in my case, because I worked in force headquarter level and the military planning staff, developing uh, projects, documents, for example, uh, force commander uh, directives, uh, 
opiorders and all the documents involving gender and child recommendations. At the same time, training, preparing the team, the gender team, because in fact, when I arrived in Central Africa, uh, there was only my position. And I prepared my team, I requested the gender personnel to work on the operational and tactical level. and. Uh, training all this person on how to use a gender perspective in peacekeeping operations. It was my, my objective when I prepared my action plan, protection of civilians. So using gender perspective. Uh, and uh, how uh, military gender advisors can assist uh, on protection of civilians. In my view, is going on the ground. It's not activity to be developed inside the office, but outside. Going on the ground, uh, uh, understanding how the conflict is affecting men, women, boys, and girls. It's very important through engagement through engagement with local population and uh, trying to understand the different routines of each group. It's very important to map the sensitive areas and the most vulnerable groups. It's something that will make different when I prepare, when I prepare the reports to my commander. Because in fact, the force can't stay all the time in all the parts, you need to target the most senses, sensitive areas. So, and uh, I did this job, I developed this job through meetings uh, with mission components, human rights, civil affairs, uh, child protection, gender, UN poll, uh, military observers. It was important to my job to understand from different points of view uh, the situation of local population and uh, the groups that were more vulnerable and more exposed to the violations. And it was a way to use this information during our plannings in order to be more effective preventing violations. So I think it's the most important job of the military gender advisor. It uh, works like an interface between the force and the community, between the force and the mission components. Uh, a good example that I can, I can provide in Minusca was a locality in Birau, broader, uh, broad, uh, borders, uh, border with uh, Sudan, where when I arrived there, it was a very good surprise because my escorting was composed only by women female peacekeepers of, wow, it's, it's a dream. And in fact, it's a place that we have uh, female peacekeepers and male peacekeepers with the same activities. And uh, female peacekeepers in frontline roles, we have engagement with local population. Uh, we have interaction with uh, mission components. So we have all the mission components working together. And it's amazing because it's an area that I have a low number of violations. In an year, one year that I work there, only one case of sexual violence. And it's something uh, really amazing that is, a, uh, I think, a whole model and a big example. And uh, I have, a, uh, I had uh, a female engagement team a very good female engagement in there, developing projects with local population. But uh, projects concerning security. So, for example, uh, working on community gardens, because in fact, in Central Africa, we have problems that women, sometimes uh, for to, when they are assessing their farms, they need to walk 15 kilometers, 10 kilometers, and when they are assessing the farm, they are very exposed to the violations. So I have reports from the Mara meeting that it's concerning conflict-related sexual violence, and a lot of cases when they are assessing the farms, when they are on the roads. So when I have projects close to the house, I can decrease the exposition to the violations. In fact, sometimes we have problems with movement restrictions. But in case of local women and, the, and the children that 
looking for, all the time looking for water, firewood. They can't stop, they need to continue. They need to continue to assess their farm because they don't have another choice. So uh, with this project, we, we could decrease uh, violations and uh, not only uh, community gardens, but lights uh, using solar panels. Uh, in, in areas where local population is more active, uh, water pump, so it's a way to, to help. And it's a, it's a place that uh, we are really protecting civilians, uh, preventing violations. So it was a good example. And uh, a place that I have uh, female and male peacekeepers interacting, what's very important, because when I have female peacekeepers, together with male peacekeepers during patrolling, it is easier for, in the case of women, that's very difficult for them to explain problems uh, concerning sexual violence. And when I have female peacekeepers, it's, uh, uh, it's a little bit easier uh, to talk about uh, special needs of different groups. So it's something that I'd like to highlight. And I can have more, uh, it's, it's a presence less offensive, and I can have more, uh, I can have this approach with the local population, what's very important in my gator information process. What is very important for us, for our military planning, is information. We need to have situational awareness about what's happening in our area. So during this interaction, this interaction, this engagement, uh, it's easier to gather this information when we develop this trust and to use this information. For example, if we have illegal taxation, if we have illegal checkpoints, the presence of armed groups in some areas. So it's very important for our job and uh, to have a better position for our troops. Because I really believe that where we are present, where we have the presence of the meat of the force, we can decrease violations. So it's something that's very important in our job. Uh, challenges, I, I can share the, the child information sharing. So uh, it was a big, big problem. And when I had my meetings with uh, mission components, I think all of us, we had the same problems. Sometimes the information was not on time and uh, was not so precise. Uh, and uh, so it, sometimes superficial information, superficial reports. So uh, it was very difficult to continue with the job. In my case, for example, it was very important to receive information, information with uh, sex aggregated data. So for example, sometimes I receive some reports, 20 civilians were injured, but uh, women, men, children. So it's important to statistic and at the same time to understand the groups that are more vulnerable. Without this kind of detail, it's very difficult to be effective in our operations. And for the next years, I think that you have more engagement because the localities that I observed that you had more uh, engagement with local population, that you have the presence of male and female peacekeepers working together. I think that we, we had a, a better, uh, ac uh, they accepted uh, on a better way the, 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 the mission and it was easier to protect them because in fact, protection of civilians is a challenge and we need to have more engagement and we need to have information, we need to have situational awareness about what's happening. So I think that if you improve uh, engagement, it's a good way to be more effective and to get your information. Without information, it's very difficult because in fact, we, we have big, uh, big areas and uh, how to, to stay all the time in all the areas. So we need to understand the routine. I remember one case in Central Africa it was in Bria, a big IDP camp, and uh, we, we had nine women that were killed in one week because they changed the routine, and we didn't uh, know about this. So, and didn't have this information, so it's something that we need to consider for the next years. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alison. 
I will have to ask you to be brief so that we can have a Q&A session. So if you can just do five minutes. Thank yes. you so much. Um, so thank you to the co-conveners and co-hosts. Uh, the permanent mission of the Netherlands and Uruguay have been such leaders on the protection of civilians through peacekeeping. It's a real privilege to serve on this panel. Um, so yes, the downfall of coming last is that I've been asked to limit my re remarks. But the benefit is that I've been preceded by amazing advocates um, who have been working to actually implement the protection of civilians through peacekeeping for many years. Um, I want to begin by reading an excerpt of an independent review of a UN peacekeeping operation which did not effectively protect civilians in the face of violence that amounted to an atrocity. The overriding failure in the response of the United Nations before and during the protection crisis can be summarized as a lack of resources and a lack of will to take on the commitment which would have been necessary to prevent or stop the violence. The UN peacekeeping operation, the main component of the United Nations presence in the country, was not planned, dimensioned, deployed, or instructed in a way which would provide for a proactive and assertive role in dealing with a peace process in serious trouble. The mission was smaller than the original recommendation from the field suggested. It was slow in being set up and was beset by debilitating administrative difficulties. It lacked well-trained troops and functioning material. I could go on. I have replaced the names of the country and the peacekeeping operation that was deployed and the specific type of violence that was being perpetrated. Without these difficulties, I think it could be difficult for some of us to guess which independent review, which special investigation this was excerpted from. It could be from those that happened about the situations of violence in the Central African Republic over the last two years, or the independent investigation of the UN's response to violence in 2016 in Juba in South Sudan. But in fact, it's actually an excerpt from the independent inquiry into the actions of the United Nations during the 1994 genocide in Rwanda. The fact that we continue to see peacekeeping operations struggle to protect civilians 20 years later can be really disconcerting. And some might use this as a justification to deprioritize protection of civilians through peacekeeping, to say it's an impossible mandate, to say that it is an Achilles heel of the UN peacekeeping operations and, and um, how we try and protect civilians. However, I would argue differently. I would use this 20th anniversary to recognize that peacekeeping operations are incredibly unique, ambitious, relatively young in their current manifestation, and necessary. We've heard today about how no other operation that seeks to promote international peace and security is multidimensional, is integrated with international development and humanitarian agencies, that no other operation is likely to get the consent that peacekeeping operations do to deploy. They are still relatively inexpensive compared to other types of international interventions with uniform components. And the international community still turns to UN peacekeeping operations to go where individual governments and regional operations often won't go for long or at all. Similarly, I would use this anniversary to recognize that the protection of civilians from other actors is still a relatively new concept. The Geneva Conventions are celebrating their 70th anniversary, but just 20 years ago, there was no doctrine or policies or guidance or training on how military should protect civilians from other actors. And in fact, today, NATO, the UK, the US, the EU, and others are looking at the UN and the African Union as the lead on how to develop that. And as Nami rec um, recognized earlier, this isn't just a military or use of force type of endeavor. It requires an integrated approach. This year provides us with an opportunity to take a hard look at what we still haven't achieved. And I was going to focus on many good practices and lessons learned, because that's what Civic, my organization, really focuses on capturing in the field, many of which have been discussed today. But I just want to mention a few really key challenges that were mentioned in the independent inquiry in 1994 and that persist today. And because we know they are problems, they can be fixed. So the first one is the inadequacy of the mandate. At that time, the mandate in Rwanda was deemed the scope to be too narrow. Today, we deal with scopes that are too broad. 
And as the Under Secretary General commented, there is a new proposal to do, well, actually, it was mentioned in the Brahimi report, but there is sort of a resurgence around sequencing and prioritizing mandates. And that is a good thing. But we do need to make sure that POC remains a priority in that sequencing when there's risk to civilians on the ground. The independent inquiry also highlighted that in the mandating process, the planning process failed to take into account remaining serious tensions which had not been solved in the peace agreement. It said there was no fallback, no contingency planning for the eventuality that the peace agreement did not succeed. And I would say that this is true still today as well. There have been tons of improvements, but we still see major gaps in the way threat assessments of violence against civilians are undertaken and how that is linked to planning and operational decision making, as well as planning decision making at the strategic level here. We continue to hear of complaints that the Security Council is either not getting frank enough advice or they aren't heeding that advice. The second thing that the independent panel found was that the UN was too focused on achieving the ceasefire. And I want to mention this because today, that can really be reinterpreted as peace agreements and political solutions. Obviously, political strategies and solutions have to be there. We can't just be a Band-Aid in these situations to protect civilians. At the same time, we cannot only focus on peace agreements and political solutions between elites, the protagonists of the parties, that have really benefited from the violence that has come before them, that they have perpetrated, that do not represent constituencies on the ground. And therefore, we need to continue to focus on subnational level mediation and peace agreements that, again, the Under Secretary General commented on, on community engagement, and on the high level independent panel of peace operations recommendation to have a more people centered approach. I'm not going to talk about the lack of analytical capacity, although CIVIC really focuses on that. We can talk about in the Q&A or after the session on that. But I want to go to the next point, which is the independent inquiry found that peacekeeping is overburdened. Inadequate resources and logistics were one of the main causes. I just, I have to read this. I know we're out of time. But Rwanda was to prove a turning point in United Nations peacekeeping and came to symbolize a lack of will to commit to peacekeeping and above all to take risks in the field. International enthusiasm for peacekeeping was diminishing. He pointed out, this is the Secretary General, the difficult financial situation the United Nations was facing. Over $1 billion existed in outstanding assessments to peacekeeping operations. If I were to read the rest of this excerpt from the independent inquiry, it would sound like something that was being said today. If we are going to issue mandates to protect civilians, just as was said in the Brahimi report and in the 2009 independent review of POC and peacekeeping, we have to give them the means. And that's not just the trained troops and civilian personnel. It's not just the capabilities and the enablers. It is the financial cost of peacekeeping. Protecting civilians has a cost. It is an investment worth making. And so we need to make sure that the civilian personnel have funding, that there is mobility so that peacekeepers can get out to the field, which is so key, as we've heard, that we have community liaison assistance, et cetera. And even more than that, we don't just need the commitment of finances. We need the commitment of political diplomatic pressure, as the Under Secretary General said, um, to really push host state governments and other armed non-state actors to protect civilians. I wish I had come up with the 5G analogy, because I think that's actually much more um, accurate than the one I use, which is I see the first chapter of protection of civilians through peacekeeping as being 1999 to 2009, where so many innovations were coming out of the field but had not yet been captured in policy, in practice, in training. We now have that, whether it's through intelligence policies, the POC strategies, et cetera. But the next chapter is going to need to be from 2019 on to be really about implementation and to do what the Under Secretary General said, which is to really look at all partners that are responsible for protecting civilians, not just blaming the peacekeepers on the ground, but looking at member states, the UN Secretary General, the Secretariat, and host state governments to really meet their commitments to protect civilians. Thanks. Thank you so much, Alison. Um, I'm conscious of the time, uh, but it would be great to have a Q&A session if Mr. 
uh, Wassily, you can afford us uh, a few more minutes. So I will take uh, a few questions from the floor. Uh, please introduce yourself. Um, and um, Bintu, maybe you have to, to, to leave now. Okay, I'm sorry about that. But <laughs> thank, thank you so much for being among us. Thank you. <laughs> um, so are there any questions from the floor? Yes, so I have one here on the left in the center. And Charlotte, here. Uh, my name is Ram Chaluri with the International Committee for Peace and Reconciliation. My question, though, two major conflicts today, they are not even addressed here today. One is what's going on in Yemen. Number two is the anticipated things that might happen between the US and Iran. If it were to happen, I think it overshadows anything that we can think of today in terms of providing support. Hi, I'm Dr. Danielli of the International Organization of Victim Assistance. I've worked in some of the <clears throat> locations you've described. Uh, and I totally, we celebrate the multidimensional uh, framework uh, in the long-term vision, now from, let me take it from the long-term back. From the victim standpoint, we are talking about civilians that you want to protect. It is the psychological trauma, not just the physical. Uh, in fact, more so than the physical, that would have lifelong and multi-generational effect. How cognizant are you of that? in your planned interventions, and how trained are you to provide psychosocial uh, uh, band-aids, uh, so to speak, because I know it's not your major mandate. Uh, because we know that if you don't, then this will go on for years and generations. Uh, good afternoon, Georgia Gagnon from UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, not really a question, just a few comments. Uh, first, just wanted to uh, reinforce what many of you said about how protection of civilians really has an impact and a result when the response, uh, when the whole process is integrated and multidimensional. Uh, as you know, uh, these peacekeeping operations have large human rights components, 100 plus staff usually spread across the country with the other parts of the mission, working in joint coordinated ways to both protect and prevent. And um, I think in the 5G going forward, uh, increased efforts on something that wasn't mentioned, but which is a key part of our work as the human rights component, is the civilian casualty uh, monitoring, recording, advocacy, follow-up, and most importantly, accountability. And this civilian casualty tracking has really advanced uh, a lot over the last several years, and uh, many militaries are now putting in place uh, these types of facilities, as even are some armed groups. Uh, but, you know, a key measure of whether POC is working is whether there's a reduction in civilian casualties, a reduction in human rights violations. So, I uh, just wanted to highlight that. Thanks. So, I don't see any other questions, so I will turn back to the panel and ask if you could provide some answers to these questions and concluding remarks in maybe one minute each. Thank you. Um, well, I'm not, I really can't answer the, the first question. I think some of our other secretary colleagues would be better positioned for that. But uh, on the psychological uh, issue, uh, that's extraordinarily important, and I think we do recognize that. Uh, and this is where we work uh, from a peacekeeping point of view with our colleagues in the UNCT, particularly UNICEF. Uh, UNFPA and, um, and UN Women in terms of uh, 
uh, victims' assistance, uh, which is which is important. Also, the the fight against impunity, which is not the psychological aspect, but it's still the justice aspect, is is also important and incorporated into uh, into our work, um, and that that we do directly um, ourselves together with UNDP and and other partners, the European Union, uh, U.S. government, etc. And I think, in the, just a, a maybe put in, I hate putting numbers to these kinds of things, but. We've been able, uh, over the last four years, I believe, to achieve o over a thousand convictions for uh, cases that have been supported through prosecution support cells and mobile courts uh, for military, police, civilian, armed group uh, individuals who've uh, carried out um, uh, gross human rights violations. So you can have progress in that area as well. Um, and then on the, the last point, and on, and on the human rights issue, wouldn't, couldn't agree more on, on that um, uh, in terms of uh, you know, better, better monitoring, better uh, uh, data collection, um, and, and, but particularly the advocacy. And, and that's something we believe in a great, great deal is that there's a lot of work. Um, for some reason, some people think that, uh, that missions are, are allergic to human rights. We're not. Uh, we're not at all. It's it's got to be an integrated part to, to our our work, and and they do heroic work on the ground. And I want to thank those individuals, uh, putting themselves at risk to collect this information, uh, but fully uh, endorse what was said. I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Lieutenant Commander Puega. In Central African Republic, uh, MINUSCA is providing psychological assistance, but in case of reported case, the problem is when we, the cases are not being reported, cases of conflictually sexual violence. When uh, we have the report, we have the medical assistance, because we have a 72 hours in order to provide the medical assistance and avoid uh, diseases, uh, sexual transmitted diseases, and at the same time uh, are being provided by NGOs, psychological treatment, and not only for victims of conflict-related sexual violence, but at the same time, children that uh, suffer with violations and, for example, abductions and uh, are being used as child soldiers, so it's, yes, it's being provided. Thank you. Um, just on the Yemen, U.S., Iran point, I think that it's really good to remember that peacekeeping operations aren't always the right solution to certain conflicts and certain problems. And this is where the recommendations from the Secretariat and the threat assessments and the advice to the Security Council is really important. There are other ways um, in which the UN can address some of these challenges through special political missions, just through different kinds of political engagement, work with um, regional uh, peace and security organizations, et cetera. Um, and on that point, also when it comes you know, to countries really investing um, diplomacy to protect civilians, including when there's a peacekeeping operation on the ground, often too much is expected and delegated to a peacekeeping operation. Member states may say, okay, the peacekeeping operation is there, it's gonna take care of the problem, we can stand back. They're doing the DDR, they're doing the SSR, even though a peacekeeping operation often has very little influence over the host state security actors on those fronts, whereas a security assistance provider may have more, et cetera. It's not that they don't have a role to play necessarily in those things, but we really need to re-examine either what we are asking peacekeepers op to do or give them more means in order to do those things. So um, that's my comment um, that doesn't quite answer your question, but made a point I wanted to make, so. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I would like to now invite um, His Excellency Mr. Erbio Vasseli to provide a concluding remarks uh, from um, the permanent uh, mission of Uruguay to the United Nations. There we go. There will be very brief remarks indeed. We are, we are out of time. Um, so it's, thank you for giving me the floor. It's been an, an honor to co-host this, this uh, meeting today. Uh, early on, uh, Jake Sherman and Carol Bonhausman and Jean-Pierre Lacroix addressed uh, some uh, very pr worth, uh, praise wor uh, words of praise to myself, which is wrong, because it is not me who deserves the praise. It is the women and men of uniform 
of Uruguay who through decades have been performing in the field a superb job in, in all the different missions they've been uh, uh, charged with. And uh, uh, David Gressley just a while ago was mentioning the fact that distinguishes the Uruguayan participation in uh, peacekeeping. We go where the, we are needed and we do the job that requires to be done. We have no caveats, we have no hidden caveats, we do exactly what is required in the time that is required. And this is why we are so insistent that others do as we do. Uh, and in that sense, uh, I will limit right now, I have several pages here, but I, will, but I will limit my comments precisely to this element. We believe that although peacekeeping missions are multidimensional and responsibilities are shared across the board by a, num a great number of actors, the very first responsibility in peacekeeping missions corresponds to the country where the con from where the contingent has been sent. The countries are responsible for protecting civilians. Protecting civilians means, number one, do not cause harm. That is, we are sent to protect, therefore the population does not have to be heard from us, either actively in acts of misconduct, those acts must be severely punished, or by lack of formation capabilities or not being well trained. Therefore, do no harm, and we, the troop, the peace, the, the troop contributing country, are the responsible for that, for the formation of the of the personnel, for the understanding of the of the rules, and for performing adequately in order to protect civilians. Uh, we also have to remember that. Uh, Armed protection is not necessarily the only way of protecting civilians. Unarmed me methods are incredibly effective and, as a matter of fact, desirable. But there are circumstances where you cannot send unarmed personnel because of the realities of the, of the, the theater. Um, very, going very, very rapidly through through my notes, I would say that what it is important today is that we keep uh, in the United Nations the different uh, instruments that we have to discuss peacekeeping, namely C-34, General Assembly, uh, the Security Council, the engagement with civil society in order to keep the pressure on the system and being able to improve more and more. Um, the need to continue with partnerships, uh, and particularly partnerships that can provide support to uh, contingents on the, on the ground. More and more peacekeeping requires equipment, both on, on the raw, cl classical raw equipment of, of armored, armored uh, vehicles or wep uh, weaponry, but today, uh, technological equipment, uh, intelligence gathering, uh, drones and everything else. And certainly, it cannot fall on the country contributing the contingents, the responsibility to invest also in equipment, which is extremely expensive uh, nowadays. Um, and last but not least, I would say, I would remind and... Uh, as Griffin was mentioning this just a few minutes ago, uh, adequate, timely, and sustained financing is fundamental for the peacekeeping uh, activities of the United Nations. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Oh, thank you. It was perfect. <laughs> Thank you. I think today's discussion provided very precious and practical insights into the way peace operations protect civilians, the remaining challenges, the reform that are 
needed. I will not try to summarize the many points raised by our impressive panelists. Um, I think they made a compelling case to continue and intensify efforts to make peace operations better fit for the protection purpose. And they offered many ideas uh, for the future generation of protection of civilians. One key takeaway, though, and I think we could have stayed here for maybe several hours, uh, I think we certainly need to sustain engagement and dialogue on this question beyond the open debate, beyond POC week. Uh, because even if tremendous progress was accomplished over the last 20 years, um, protection of civilians remains a core issue for which better accountability is needed. So on behalf of Civic and IPI, I want to thank you all for participating in this policy forum. And please thank, uh, join me in thanking our speakers for this excellent discussion. Thank you.